My videos often highlight historical dilemmas. Should we spend money on a flawed aeroplane to fill a capability gap for a few years? Should I get into a turning fight with that MiG? Should we try to shoot down that runaway aircraft or risk it crashing down on a city? Hindsight often makes the decision maker look unfairly foolish because we invariably lack full context. But we likely wouldn't have wanted to be in their position. On the 13th of September 1973, the commanders of the Syrian Air Force faced such a dilemma. History generally makes out that they made the wrong call. I think otherwise. By mid-September 1973, Syria and Egypt were secretly mobilised for war. Their objective was to retake land that they believe had been stolen from them and to restore their dignity in a world that had them for buffoons. To this end, Syria had just received a large shipment of armaments from their backers in the Soviet Union. The Soviets, it should be said, were also in the dark about the Syrian and Egyptian plan. They essentially just wanted to earn some foreign currency and thumb their nose at the Americans. They regarded the Syrians with contempt and thought that it would be years before they could challenge Israel again. Big Soviet cargo ships arrived in Latakia and Tartus and began to unload. This was the last shipment of weapons that would be received before the war would begin in early October. These were the days before mass containerization. Cargo, particularly heavy cargo like artillery guns, shells and vehicles, was unloaded from the holds using cranes and manpower. It was a highly visible process. The Syrians' Israeli enemies were both smart and alert. The Soviet ship's passage had definitely not gone unnoticed. Israel wanted a look at what was going on, and as was often the case, the IDAF AF was the tool by which that information was to be obtained. The IDF, for their part, likely relished the chance to tangle with the Syrians. They'd been baiting Syrian and Egyptian pilots into ambushes for years and had become highly adept. The arrival of F-4 Phantoms had given them even more options. Now, the Syrian Air Force and its pilots weren't idiots. They understood the Israeli tactics in detail. Working out how to counter them with the resources they had available was very hard. Syrian aviators referred to the typical IDF ambush as having four component formations. First was the bait. Just before two in the afternoon on September the 13th, 1973, two RF-4E Phantoms took off and streaked out high over the Mediterranean. They headed straight for Tartus. Syrian radar picked them up. So here's the dilemma for the Syrian High Command. They didn't want the Israelis to get a read on the size of the shipment they had just received. It was so large that it would arouse suspicion but they also didn't want to reveal how alert and ready they were as it would have the same potential result of alerting the Israelis. And, of course, they recognised that this was the bait in a trap and springing that trap would cost them valuable warplanes and pilots. As I said, they weren't stupid. The trouble was that doing nothing would probably be the most suspicious thing they could do. The Israelis thought they were impulsive and tactically naive. Syrians always took the bait. So four MiG-21 PFMs were scrambled from Hammer to intercept the Phantoms. Another four launched from Abu Abdahor minutes later. As they bore down on the two reconnaissance aircraft, the Israelis turned tail and made to flee south. The Hammer group bounced the Israelis just over the coast. Their flight leader launched a pair of R-3S Atolls from close range and was rewarded when both tracked perfectly and exploded in the wake of the trailing Phantom. He claimed a kill, but didn't have time to celebrate. The Syrians called the second stage of the Israeli ambush Momentum. These fighters were the first to actually engage in air-to-air -air combat, and their role was to escalate the fight, to keep it simmering and to draw more Syrian aircraft in. A flight of mirages had been lurking low, below the Syrian ground control radar horizon. They pounced on the first flight of MiGs and shot down two of them before they could react. The other two MiGs turned and fled. The second Syrian flight attempted to cut the mirages off, 
but they were themselves jumped by a flight of neshers. These were the cover formation, the purpose of which is obvious. The neshers fired their missiles on the way in, shooting down two MiGs. The remaining pair engaged the Israelis in a dogfight, losing another of their number before the remaining pilots succeeded in hitting a nesher with an atoll and forcing the pilot to eject. Its pilot parachuted down just half a mile from one of the Syrians. They bobbed around in their rafts within shouting distance of each other. I imagine some choice words were exchanged. An hour later, the battle restarted. Israeli helicopters swooped in to rescue their pilot and his Syrian counterpart. Furious at their losses, another flight of MiGs were sent to intercept. This time, as they engaged the momentum flight of Mirages, they encountered the final component in the ambush plan. As the MiGs engaged the Mirages, single aircraft gradually became isolated from their comrades. Suddenly, out of nowhere, phantoms appeared, launching sparrows and then boring in to finish the job with sidewinders or cannon fire. The isolated MiGs could do little to defend themselves against this new threat. Three were shot down. Their wing leader, on his second mission of the day, once again found himself isolated, but claimed to have killed a second phantom before he succeeded in disengaging and returning to base. The Battle of Tartus made international news headlines. Israel claimed 12 kills and a probable. Syria admitted to five losses, but claimed two in return. The real ratio is more likely eight Syrian MiG-21 losses to one Israeli Nesha and a damaged Phantom. Captain Elgar, the leader of the Hammer flight, was nevertheless credited with two kills, promoted and awarded the Hero of Syria medal for destroying two Phantoms in air-to-air combat. As ever, claims and reality are often different things. We'll likely never know definitively what happened. What the encounter does demonstrate is that the MiG-21 pilot stood little chance against mirages and phantoms in these ambushes. Although pilot skill is always a factor, the main issue that the Syrians faced was the poor quality of the R-3S missiles with which their fighters were armed. Or, more accurately, their lack of suitability for use in a dogfight. Gun camera footage shows that MiG-21 pilots were able to get into firing positions against phantoms and mirages, but they didn't have the weapons to finish the job. The PFM lacked an internal cannon, and the Syrians didn't have access to the admittedly rudimentary alkali semi-active radar homing missile or the improved AFID IR missile. Although the MiG-21 was manoeuvrable enough, and the Syrian pilots skilled enough to stay in a dogfight with a Mirage, Nesher or Phantom, they carried a lot less fuel and invariably were forced to disengage earlier. At that point they were fair game, especially to the boxer formation of Phantoms. In an all-out, two-front war, the Syrians felt that they might not be as disadvantaged in terms of tactical setup, and therefore might have more success. If this was the Syrian conclusion, the Israelis saw the battle as a validation of their overall view. The Syrians were impetuous amateurs and could be easily beaten. Moreover, the IDAF-AF claimed that the reconnaissance mission was successful. Reading the various accounts of the action, I can't help but think that the Israeli pilots and commanders' killer instinct took over. They focused on killing MiGs rather than the strategic intelligence gathering that was required. It may be true that some photos were taken, but what is certain is that the wrong conclusions would be drawn. In less than a month, Israel would be at war.